such a lovely warm atmosphere. And, and also to come here to the Conway Hall, where it's um, a building with such history. I, I'm sure you know better than I the kind of the history of this building and what it's meant um, to British culture. Um, but then there's a particular moment um, in the early 40s um, when some really, really interesting things happen here in this building. Um, you know, it's before the Americans have entered the war and Britain is beginning to realise what this Second World War is actually going to mean in terms of resources. And so it turns to its colonies and it begins to have conversations about trying to engage with people across Africa, Asia, who um, have been British um, Empire citizens to try to convince them to do more than just producing the goods which are helping to supply the soldiers and to supply the people who are working in mus musicians munitions factories, but to actually come forward and actually stand shoulder to shoulder with other soldiers on the front lines. And there is a realisation, I think, in Britain for the very first time that we're asking people to actually make this sacrifice, perhaps even the ultimate sacrifice, to fight fascism, to fight this appalling regime that denies people their rights, denies people their opportunity to vote, their freedom, when we are actually restricting these people's rights in their countries of birth, denying them their opportunity to vote. The ironies of that struck home. And Britain, for the very first time, I think, began to think, we're going to have to change our relationship that the, what the war will mean, particularly, you know, in winning the war, is that we're going to have to reconsider our relationship with our colonies. And in this space, in this space, over the course of the 40s, some of the African leaders of resistance movements, who would later on go on to actually run their countries or to sit in cabinets, come through the Conway Hall and they set it on fire with passionate words and um, they absolutely changed the political discourse. Um, do you still have that feeling that this is a place that is uh, you know, buzzing with possibilities? Um, and you know, it's wonderful to be here. I, I have a tiny little study at home, you know, that if you open the door, I have to kind of stand up. It's, it's very, very small, but it is packed full with books. And, at eye level, when I'm sitting down, I've made sure that the books that I have are books that remind me of some of the great thinkers from that period of a little bit beyond. And one of my absolute favourites um, is um, a Derek Walcott connection of his poems. And I occasionally bring it down off of my bookshelf, and I just have to hit the, um, the book on the table with its spine, and it opens to um, a particular page, um, which is a poem that I read regularly, and it starts with this fantastic line, where is my tribal memory? It's a question that Walcott asks, not just of himself, I think he's asking of all black people, where are your monuments, it goes on, where are your battles, where are your martyrs? And they're difficult questions when they're asked the people of uh, African descent. But they're questions that I've striven throughout my career to answer. Where are my monuments? Where are my battles? Where are my martyrs? And when they're asked so directly, they could be interpreted as not being questions about identity um, and dislocation, cultural dislocation, but that's something more existential than that. Something about the very lack of written history. The lack of, the kind of actual, possibly, the existential thought that it might not be that there is black history. And this is something that many of the great thinkers in the Enlightenment period have posed. 
that there is something different about the relationship between black people and their heritage. You know, since medieval Europeans sought out the Prester John, you know, he was that mythical African king that they hoped would lead the Second Crusade. They sought out African and black cultures that were like theirs. They wanted to find buildings, they wanted to find material culture, they wanted to find bodies of, 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 of evidence that would give them a sense that there were, there were kinds of, uh, of, 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 of cultures that were similar to the ones that they saw in Europe. I just wanted to try and get this. <coughs> They sought out what Kant, Immanuel Kant, described as architectonic bodies of knowledge, complex cultural superstructures with their own intellectual provenance, and just like the ones that they thought underpinned European culture. But as Kant and his contemporaries wrote, they simply couldn't find them. I mean, Walcott's, his response to this question of where African heritage lies, when he asks, where is my tribal memory at the beginning of this poem, he answers it with this really powerful, emphatic line. Sirs, that in that gray, that gray vault, the sea, the sea has locked them up. The sea is history. And it's a devastating response the complete, unnegotiable loss of past and narrative. And if you think about it, that the brutality of forced slavery is only one of the challenges if you want to uncover black history. Because what Kant is trying to actually say is that African or black history isn't like other histories, that it didn't exist. I mean, it wasn't a view that he held alone. That this idea of there not there being a void in you know in, in terms of history of, of, of Africa was something that people like Hume agreed with. He wrote actually of the hundreds of thousands of blacks who were transported from elsewhere from their countries. Although many of them were set free, still not a single one has presented a greatness in art or science or any other praiseworthy quality. So fundamental is the difference between the two races that it's as different, it's as different in colour as it is in terms of intelligence. And similar views, this wasn't, uh, it wasn't isolated from this view. Similar views were held by, by Locke, by Hegel, by Hume. Um, and what they were doing was setting up this contrast between Africa and the cultures of Europe. So when you ask again, where is my tribal memory? The question then, it, it's something that shakes you. It could be an ironic taunt. It could infer not just that history has been lost, but that it could never be. In 1871, Karl Mausch, he was a German geologist. He was working in southern Africa, and he stumbled across an extraordinary complex of abandoned buildings. And these were amazing things. And he never quite recovered from what he found. I mean, these are granite, dry stone um, buildings. And that if you visit Great Zimbabwe, it is astounding. They just sit on an outcrop, almost kind of like floating above this sort of rocky crag. And Mansch, he had no idea who was responsible for this astounding feat of architecture. But one thing that he was absolutely sure about was that these were created by Africans. And he, like dozens of other Europeans who followed in his footsteps, speculated on who could have produced them. And he said, I can't be far wrong if I suppose that this ruin on the hill is actually, was actually a copy of, of Solomon's temple. And as I'm sure that you know, that he hadn't stumbled upon, upon a copy of Solomon's Temple, but on a purely 
African constructed, purely African complex of buildings. It's constructed um, from the 11th century onward. But like Leo Frobenius, who was a contemporary German anthropologist, who years afterwards, just a few years afterwards, he came across um, these Ife heads. Um, and he speculated, again, these couldn't have been produced by Africans. But he thought they must have been, and this is meant to be a, a kind of same rational man with um, an academic um, history, and he speculated they were produced possibly by um, um, the lost kingdom of, they came from the lost kingdom of Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> and these are ideas that are so irrational and obviously so deeply held that even in the face of physical evidence, physical archaeology, they couldn't rationally see anymore. They were blinded. And it's a perspective which to contemporary years is, um, is pretty horrendous. But to some extent, our views on Africa remained obscured by the same sort of fog. We know less about the history of Africa than any other continent. I mean, if, if Mauch really wanted to find answers to his questions about Great Zimbabwe, I mean, he would have had to have actually have begun his journey a thousand miles from Great Zimbabwe, on the eastern edge of the, of, 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 of the continent, where Africa meets the Indian Ocean. And he would have had to trace the trail of gold and goods from the great trading emporia on the Swahili coast to this mercantile mecca of Great Zimbabwe. And he would have got a picture of this as a political and cultural entity. And this was a kingdom that traded with many other similar status um, 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 cultures and it created a, a fantastic economic symbiosis with them. You know, for centuries, traders were drawn down the Swahili coast by the gold that's produced here. Traders that come from as far away as India, China, the Middle East. These were cultures that were drawn not just by trade, but by culture, by the, the, the stability of this, of, of, of this, of this um, civilization, but particularly because of a trade in gold. And recent research suggests that this was an intercontinental trade in gold as well. It wasn't just leaving Africa. It was traversing internally across Africa. And it might be tempting to just see it as a symbolic jewel, but it was actually part of a nexus of different and similar kinds of communities. So, you know, we have a, a map here. So, Great Zimbabwe is up here. Um, this is Mapungubwe, which is um, another site. And down here on the coast, you can see there is Namikeni. And up in this region are places like Kilwa, um, which were. Um, which were trading areas that were trading right out into the Indian Ocean. And a lot of the food would travel wonderful goods from across the Indian Ocean and traveling back would be gold. And today, if you travel a few hundred miles from the Mozambique capital, you come to one of the most exciting of the cities um, that formed the trade routes between um, Zimbabwe and the coast, Manapeni. And you can get a sense of how the stone is used in a similar sort of way. And this was between the 12th and the 17th centuries that this place was very highly populated. It was one of the net number of different outstations of Great Zimbabwe. And a few areas have been robbed out over um, the centuries since it was, it was used, but you still get a sense of very clearly defined areas of an inner sanctum, 
um, but also of areas for, for, for the cattle. It's very kind of carefully, carefully conceived. And on the west side, which is here, you get a little gap in the wall, and beyond those are Zimbabwe grasses, on which the people who lived within this enclosure would have fed their cattle, and then they would have, they would have herded them, drove them across the plains toward Madden Goodway and beyond to Great Zimbabwe. But of course, coming through here would have been gold um, going up the coast toward Kilwa and out across the Indian Ocean and coming back would have been marvellous things like pottery, um, you know, different kinds of, of, uh, of metal and technologies as well. And it opened up the whole of this region, a new, a new period of, of, of trade and intellectual exchange. And one of the most important areas was Mountain Gumbwe, which sits um, between two rivers, sits on the top of this huge slab of sandstone. And um, it's produced these amazing archaeological finds, amongst which it was um, uh, a golden rhino. And but it's hard to, I mean, to, to you, unless you actually see it, it's hard to actually translate quite how beautiful and quite how skilled the people who made this um, actually were. It's tiny, it could fit in the palm of my hand. And it's crafted with such a finesse, the gold is so thin that you could blow it and it would actually move across your hand. So you can imagine how carefully it's actually been crafted how delicately the love that's gone into creating this thing. And so these were people who, they were enormously wealthy, that this was the people who, they must have had an incredible army to defend these trade routes, to defend um, these sites. But they were also deeply interested in aesthetics, in culture. They had the time to consider these things, the time to make them the time to build this complex tradition. I mean, it's strange that this magnificent, magnificent history of one of, I would say, one of the world's greatest cultures was utterly invisible to the first Europeans. And I've spent much of my career trying to clear some of the fog that surrounds some of these magnificent histories. And there's so much that should be common knowledge about Africa. But, I mean, this is the second most populous continent, the second biggest continent. It's the continent with the longest historical narrative, and some of the most well-preserved archaeology. But somehow, it remains something of a mystery to us. And, you know, what? an omission to our general knowledge. I mean, this is a huge continent. And you can fit the US, Western Europe. You can fit much of Central Europe. You can fit Japan, China, India into its silhouette. And this is Britain down here. This is us <laughs> in Madagascar. This is a vast continent with thousands of ethnic groups. The US could very happily sit in the Sahara, and that, that's, a, that's a, the region that I just want to spend a bit of time talking about. I mean, even, I mean, it's a byword for inhospitable, for being inhospitable, but it has a fascinating history, a rich history. It might be a kind of, seem like a barren, featureless landscape, but even here, there is rich and fascinating history. I mean, this is a place called Meroe, which is in Sudan. It's in the east of the Sahara. Um, and you can see these sort of, if you fly over it, as I had the privilege to, to you see these pyramids sitting beached in the desert sand. Nothing almost. It is absolutely astounding. But, if 
you get down in amongst them, look on the sides of the side panels, carved into them are what look like healthy oxen. These are healthy oxen ploughing what must have been green fields. And more than 3,000 miles away, over here, in the area of Tassili. And this is another place which is pretty much desolate. But up on the walls of Tassili, you find these gorgeous paintings. And they describe herds of animals being driven across verdant plains. These, are, these archaeological clues give us a sense of what this region was like, this barren region. About 4,000 years ago, you know, within the span of oral history, the Sahara was lush, it was green, and it support, supported a complex ecology and a variety of nomadic communities. A diversity of wildlife, and you can see here, lots and lots of different kinds of, of, of animals. But with climate change came new ways of life. And it's, it's absolutely no co coincidence that many of the greatest civilizations the world has ever seen actually develop around the edge of the Sahara. You have Nubia, Carthage, um, the Berbers up at the top, um, Ghana, Songhai, and many others. And they thrive on the edge of the Sahara. Because as this desert was growing, the communities, they actually found their traditional ways of life tested under threat. But dazzling new cultures began to actually develop out of these difficulties. The actual changes in the environment, concentrated communities, and hard-won skills and new knowledge she transforms these cultures. And within a very short period of time, things are happening that would have been unthinkable a few hundred years before. And one of the one of the civilizations that developed that I want to talk about is Mali and its main city, Timbuktu. Um, you probably will remember that at the beginning of 2013, I mean, we, you probably saw it on the news, I watched in absolute horror as um, many of Mali's most ancient monuments were deliberately damaged or destroyed. And it was an example of how these histories, that they're not dead, that they still continue to tackle with relevance. I mean, this was a campaign um, of systematic vandalism by a group called Ansadin. And Ansadin are an Al-Qaeda-affiliated militia. And they pushed further and further south from their, um, um, from their desert strongholds. And they came into these regions of real historical importance. And they destroyed tombs. They burnt manuscripts, they damaged buildings, and eventually they converged around the city of Timbuktu. Now Timbuktu, I mean, in English parlance, it's, it's kind of synonymous with being something which is far away, exotic, unknown. But this is a world heritage site. It's known locally as the city of 333 saints. It's the home of 16 shrines of, Su of Sufis, or they're sort of like saints. Um, it was an obvious high value target for these chaps. And the fighting was brief, but absolutely devastating. Um, parts of the mosque were destroyed, about 4,000 documents went missing. Um, many other documents were taken out of the city, never to return. Um, one of the ancient um, schools um, 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 was burnt down. Um, 
the, the university, which was absolutely the, the key and core of the city, um, was seriously damaged. And it's the collection of buildings, which are about, some of them, built around 1327, mostly from straw, from wood, with limestone reinforcements. Many of them were very, very seriously damaged. And this is a, this is a civilization that was wrestled from this incredibly tough environment that I was describing before in the 13th century. Um, and if you can imagine all of these changes, the shifting trade routes, the societal chaos, and Ghana, which was the great empire at the beginning of that period, it goes through a period of difficulty. And there is a realization that a new set of political alliances could mean an opportunity for real change. And what it needs is an exceptional leader. And stepping, step, stepping forward is this guy, Sunjata Keita. And he is a formidable military strategist. And he's a visionary. And you know, like so many people who are immortalized in African, West African stories, um, he's someone who absolutely leads from the front. And he's, he's now remembered in a huge number of songs um, by uh, griots who, who play instruments and sing these beautiful poetic kinds of passages that recall this history. And he's remembered as the man who united all of those broken states that were once part of the Ghana Kingdom into this new kingdom of Mali. And this is a formidable kingdom. And he builds it, a kingdom, around the idea of this new story. A story of his family being at the centre of this burgeoning, um, outward-looking, um, deeply integrated uh, civilization. But a century after Sujata, a new kind of leader ascends the throne. And his name is Mansa Musa. And he has a different kind of ambition. He's actually thought to be not just the richest man who lived at that time, but possibly the richest man who's ever lived. I mean, he had such vast gold reserves that he was sending envoys to courts in, in Europe and the Middle East. And he was every bit as ambitious as his predecessors. But he saw a different route to securing his place in history. He wasn't interested like, like um, Sujata Keita in oral history. He wanted to write down his story. He wanted it fixed on paper. With oral tradition, things could always be changed. The power was in the hand of the person who told the story, the griot. Writing it down, fixed it. It was the basis, the, the beginnings of the basis of what would become a university, offering the chance for different disciplines beyond just it being one person who would record and memorize history. This was a chance or disciplines of, you know, within the sciences, within the arts, to begin to develop. And this man was so wealthy, but at the same time so invested in the idea of knowledge that he decided he was going to travel. And he wanted to travel to Mecca to get more knowledge. And he traveled with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scholars because he wanted his scholars to meet scholars in North Africa and also in the Middle East and to bring back new knowledge. And they travelled with a hundred camels and a hundred pounds of gold on each one of those, those camels. And every single day, every single day that they would stop, they would build a fully functioning mosque. And he performed so many acts of charity that one Berber chronicler, uh, Ibn Battuta, he recalled that he spent so much in North Africa that it collapsed the price of gold into the next century. 
And on his return, he um, was immortalized in building a new central mosque in uh, Timbuktu. <coughs> this is a place that represents one of the great bodies of written material, of medieval written material. 700,000 African documents. And these range from scholarly, scholarly tracts to short letters to, um, you know, there are maps of the skies. Um, there are all kinds of things. You get a picture of what medieval <coughs> Africa was like. And this is the place, if you think of what Hegel and his, his contemporaries were saying, this is a place without history. But this, in reality, was a place with rich, deep, deep history. <laughs> and at its peak in the 16th century, this is a university, I mean, this is a town, okay, with, with a population of about 100,000, which was big there. But it has 25,000 students. And it attracts not just students from across Africa, and they weren't just students from North Africa, they're coming from right across West Africa, but also from the Middle East, students and teachers. It was a center of learning with a huge reputation. And I'm sure you know you know that that you know that at Christmas there is the third major, the African major. My thought is that that is a figure who was based on Mansa Musa. This is a map of Mansa Musa with Timbuktu. In our parlance, this place that is far away, that can never be found, too far away. I'm going to Timbuktu, it means you're going to the end of the world. But this map, created in Spain, Timbuktu is the very center of it. This is Mansa Musa, gold surrounded by gold, being visited by Ibn Battuta, a great North African trader coming from Morocco, another intellectual center, contemporary. But the idea of all of these different trade routes crisscrossing the continent, not just from the north, but also from, from the south, from West Africa, we're talking about African intellectual tradition, which was self-supporting, but also which was being exported beyond the African continent. And I've I visited libraries across Africa, and Hegel's idea that Africa didn't have history, not only does this continent have an embarrassment, an embarrassment of historical data, unrivaled methods of collecting and promoting history. There are thousands of small African archives and, and textile stores and drum stores and they're more than repositories of, of manuscripts and material culture. They become like communal narratives, places where people would gather and they would feel themselves reflected in these collections of important materials. Um, beneath, I actually think, for those Europeans who actually said that Africa didn't have history, I actually think beneath their prejudices, they must have been aware of these figures. They must have been. Because from the medieval period, they had looked to Africa for the Prester John, this figure who would come and lead another crusade. They were aware of it, but they chose to be blind to it. And this was obviously a culture that didn't grow up in isolation. And it developed. This is an intellectual center that develops because it respects the plurality of knowledge. That knowledge comes from a variety of places and it's better because of its hybridity. At a similar sort of time, on the other side of the continent, possibly trading with them was Ethiopia. And much like Mali, this developed as a confident culture with international trading links. 
right out across um, the Middle East. I mean, it was. I mean, it, if you go there, I mean, the incredible thing is that if you visit Mali, that a lot of the archaeology is is hidden in Ethiopia. It is absolutely there, and present, and still very much alive. And where in Mali there was the epic of Sunjata, in Ethiopia there is this story that the Kebra Nagast. It's a 13th century manuscript that tells the story of the emperors of Ethiopia, and it does it almost like it's a scripture. Um, it tells of how the kingdom is founded in 950 BC. It tells the story of its first emperor, who is pictured here, Menelik, um, and how he is actually tied into the family of the Queen of Sheba and all of the Old Testament families. And what they were seeking is a kind of legitimacy in those biblical stories. And Ethiopians argue that Christianity in Ethiopia has a longer and truer history than anywhere else. And, you know, there are very, very technical arguments to support that. I mean, the way that Islam took root in Mali, it, it's similar to the way in which Christianity took root in Ethiopia. They are built, they don't just drop like a kind of spaceship. They actually fit into local um, indigenous, um, sui generis um, cultural practices. And this is a place called Haram, which is um, to the east uh, of Ethiopia. And this is a place that acted as a conduit for ideas that came from right across the Arabian Peninsula. And it becomes the first trading um, um, centre and pulls in a great deal of wealth, but also intellectuals from um, right across the Middle East. And these are, this it becomes the intellectual engine for the development of the area from the 7th to the 11th century. And one of the most interesting emperors who founds this city of Gondar, his name is Phasilidus, and he uses Harar as a trading hub. And he wants it to be much like Mount Sabusa, not just a, a centre um, for commerce, but a centre which was fully invested in bringing ideas from right across the Middle East into his new city of Gondar. And he uses his huge profits, huge profits, taxing local people to build up um, his, new, his new city and build a fantastic library within it. And this has been called the Camelot of, of, of Africa for obvious reasons. It's absolutely exquisite if you ever get the chance to visit. And on, this, on the edge of Gondar is this church, Deborah, um, Deborah Bahan Selassie. And it was built for um, um, Emperor Ilassi. And he was a close successor of Basilidus um, in the 17th century. And on the outside, it's incredibly modest. It almost looks kind of quite some suburban. But you step inside, and it is glorious, just hand-painted, very, very beautiful. Um, they're covered in large, brightly painted um, panels, and all with distinctively Ethiopian eyes. And this is, I mean, for the first Europeans who must have arrived here, they must have been shocked, because I think the idea that Christianity was something that was just brought by missionaries, but this is Christianity that is absolutely African. And then, a little bit earlier, in the 12th century, this is Lale Bella, which was built as a place of pilgrimage. In fact, like Mansa Musa, 
Nali Bella, who was the king, that he wanted to build a center of his religious beliefs, not he didn't want it to be in Jerusalem, he wanted it to be here on the African continent. And what's different about Nali Bella is that these buildings were built by placing one brick upon another. These are carved from a solid mountain. These are, each one of these, separate, discrete churches, 12 of them, 13, sorry, is carved, extruded from the rock. And, I mean, to go there is absolutely amazing. And, and the strange thing is that if, when you enter these buildings, that you'd imagine that they would be bad and would be kind of like troglodytic, but it doesn't feel like that. They are so well designed that it, it's a very hot region, but it is beautifully cool, incredibly fresh, and the light that comes in through these windows, they are incredibly dark inside, but the way in which the light cascades through these spaces is absolutely exquisite. The architectural foresight to actually carve something from solid stone and you are talking about the 12th century as well. I mean, of course, like Great Zimbabwe, all kinds of different legends arose about this miracle site. I mean, including the belief that they were built, they were completed at superhuman speed. Um, and what they were trying to do is to write themselves indelibly into the history of the region. But what they demonstrate, I think, probably more profoundly than that, is how complex these pre-colonial African um, cultures actually were. How each one of them had international connections. How each one of them was open to international ideas, but made those ideas their own. I mean, this, these are ideas, you know, the manifestation of Christianity, which is as much African as it is as, 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 it belong, as, as Christianity belongs to any of the realms. Um, but, and I think this is something that I think isn't actually very much acknowledged, is that this is a coin um, from the 4th century. This is King Azana. And the King Azana, what's fascinating about him is that he converts to Christianity. So, you get a sense of how these civilizations changed over the period in, of his reign. And what was actually pre-Christian, you can see, you can gauge as being, kind of, you can see that very clearly as being pre-Azana, and what is actually kind of influenced by Christianity as post-Azana. And if you go to Yeha. This is not too far from the previous site. Um, and this was actually created at the time of when the Old Testament prophets were writing. And this is pre Christian. Um, it predates anything, anything that um, you know that you know that was happening in Europe um, that is connected to Christianity. It's absolute, and yet if you go and you see the quality of this brickwork even today, it's absolutely astonishing that this is older than the Parthenon in Greece. It's centuries older than Rome's Colosseum, um, and these are the cultures that um, Iyasu was standing on the shoulders of. And what you get a sense of here is how those traditions of using honey, which they still use um, in, 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 in their church services, um, of many of the sorts of traditions that they actually have as part of, 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 of their manifestation of Christianity were in fact actually pre-Christian. You get the sense of the longevity of there of these um, belief systems. But it mirrors patterns that were happening 
across the continent in Barnum. And this is um, the bend of the River Niger. I'll whiz through this now. But this is a place called Onjuga. And after its, its region is incredibly wet, the River Niger bends up from the coast into the Sahara. And I, you know, it probably thinks, my God, it's getting hot, and then it sort of, sort of sinks <laughs> away. And, and, but at the top, the crest the, of the bend, um, that is one of the regions where there is a huge concentration of civilizations, and that's where Onjuga is. And after a rainstorm, a bank of a river collapsed, and <coughs> 11,500 years of archaeology was revealed in, in strata. And what they found were, was the, uh, the complexity of the different kinds of civilizations that have lived in this region. What I'm trying to give you a sense of is that the Islam and the Christianity that you see manifest today. They weren't things that, as you see them, that were introduced into communities that were tabula rasa. They were introduced into deeply complex and um, um, culturally advanced civilizations already. So this is the excavation of the jungle. And not far from there is Bandagara. <coughs> and Bandagara is, um, is was known for the Telem. And the Telem, that they are pretty mysterious in history, not much is known about them. But about 2,000 years ago, the Telem lived in these caves. And they were supposed to have the secret of being able to fly. And you can imagine why, and it's, it's pretty precarious up there, so it's absolutely terrifying. And if you go into these caves, many of them have these beautiful um, vats that are made from, from earth. The earth that is found around mixed with, it's actually, it's actually earth which is taken from the side of termite hills because when the termites eat um, the leaves, they secrete cellulose and that, uh, that is used in, these, in, in this particular kind of mix and it makes the it makes them much more um, weather durable. And they create these facts because what they were trying to do, that their predecessors were probably nomadic, but they had created technologies that meant that they could store their grain. And once they could store their grain, store energy, it then meant that they could have downtime. They didn't have to be nomadic. It meant that they could actually spend. But look at the technologies, the technologies that are being used in these grain stores. Do they remind us that these are the same sorts of Adobe technologies that will be used later on in those mosques? What I'm trying to demonstrate is how those Islamic traditions, or seemingly Islamic traditions, are actually African. They are indigenous traditions. They aren't about religion. They are about something which is much more fundamental, much more native, much more indigenous. And I'm sorry at the quality of this slide, but if you, well, when you go into these caves, the really strange thing is the kind of crunching underfoot. And it's only when your eyes actually get used to the level. I'm sorry that this is a, but this is actually, a, I think it's a femur, a human femur. And that's because the people who replaced the telem when they disappeared about, um, the telem actually disappear about the time that Mansa Musa is building Timbuktu. And, they're replaced by the Dogon. And the Dogon come into this region and they realize these, these caves are very special. And they use these caves as a place of burial. And so when you go into these caves, they are carpeted with the bones of, of, of the Dogon. But the Dogon, they also took from the Telem that idea of grain silos, of storing energy. And this is the Dogon door from one of their grain silos. And their doors are carved, but what they have as a way of acknowledging that past is that they create these beautiful lattices, which are the same patterns that are also found on the side of the grain silos. There's an acknowledgement of that history that they are
are standing on the shoulders of these giants of technology. And this is um, in Jenne, which isn't far away. But Jenne is of a later period. And this, I mean, the thing about Jenne, which is very odd, I mean, I've done, I've worked on archaeological sites in Britain. And, um, you know, you go days and you don't find anything. And, um, you know, then someone finds something the size of a thumbnail and most kind of, you know, everyone comes. This place here, the archaeology is 11 meters thick. 11 meters thick of solid archaeology. You cannot walk in this place for pots. And these are pots which tell the story of the continuity of this region. And one of the things that we get is these pots. Can you see the surface of this, which has got these these little lines. This was a technology that was developed at the time of the tenor. But what they would do is they would create these striations on the external surface of their pots or on the grain silos. And what that meant was that on the outside, the water would condense and it would cool the content of what was inside. And it was a technology that meant in these very hot conditions that you could keep food cool. It was a myth that you could travel with food, that you could store food. What these technologies give you a sense of is the complexity of these places. But these designs as well are the designs that you see on the Dokon doors and also um, that we saw on those wonderful grain silos. It's that rep repetition, that understanding, that idea of standing on the shoulders of intellectual giants, of respecting your past. That idea of Hegel, this is a place without history. It's not just a place with history, it's a place that understood how to respect and use its history and to use those technologies. And what Islam, what Christianity are doing is standing on the shoulders of what was already there. So this is the central mosque. So this is probably the grand manifestation of those technologies. You know, and it is glorious. And these were the kinds of things that um, were being targeted, targeted by Anthony. Beautiful. And, you know, today, I mean, it is, whatever way one takes it, it's unfortunate this place that was created as a liberal centre in which people could come from right across the region, whatever their religion, whatever their faith, whether they believed or not, they could come into this religious city and Max Mutsa created it so that he could bring the finest minds, the best learning to make a new kind of, of empire. And it's such a shame that today, Anzadeen, this reactionary group of thugs, that they have tried to destroy these centres of intellectual excellence that were absolutely dedicated to celebrating, alongside of that, um, that plurality, celebrating Islam. Um, and this is actually a picture of the central um, um, university um, that, was, that, that was actually built in 1327, but was seriously damaged in the 2013 um, um, problems. This is the, the picture of it actually being rebuilt. And last, the week before last, um, Abu Tura, um, who was one of the main instigators of, of the damage of these buildings, um, he began his trial at the Hague. And you know, the interesting thing I think is, is that you think about the sorts of people who've been tried at the Hague, it is usually ethnic cleansing, it is, you know, it is it is the things which kind of palpably make us, you know, feel you know unwell. Um, but what they were trying to do was to unravel a culture by decapitating it from its material its material culture so that these people had no symbols that would unite them. Um, and what it was uniting them to wasn't just Islam. 
What I'm trying to show is that both here and in Ethiopia, that these traditions that may manifest themselves as Christianity and as Islam were actually far longer and far deeper than just religion. I'll stop there. Thank you very much.